Well, g'day mums and dads, boys and girls, and welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. I'm Troy, and of course, as usual, sitting right next to me here is my dear friend, Brian. How are you, Brian? I'm good, mate. Um, I, you know, we do sometimes ask how our week was, but I don't know, I'm not really caring too much about how the week was. I just want to see it, see it gone. But it's been, it's been lots happening in the group, hasn't it? There has been lots happening in the group, but I just want to stop. Is it you don't care about my week or you don't care about your own week? Whose week do you not care about? I just don't care about weeks in general. I just, I don't know what it is. It's just something that I don't, I just don't care for. And, you know, our listeners probably don't care for us talking about each other's weeks all the time, but I'll pander to you. How was your week? Well, when I was young, my mum used to say to me that I was slow as a wet week. Did your mum used to say that one to you? You're as slow as a wet week. Yeah, it's one of those sayings where I'm like, what does that even mean? I mean, mothers quite often came up with those sayings, didn't they? I'm going to knock you into next week. Yeah, yeah, that's I, right. I used to get that. But you can tell I grew up in the 70s because parents did say, I'm going to knock you into next week if you don't pull your head in. Yeah, and they often did too. Yes, to that's be true. honest. But yes. let's not talk about our trauma from... From our parents. But let's go back to the trauma from the church. Mm. So today's guest, we've got Brie, and she's she's a self-described millennial, mum, wife, and a daughter of former or still current Pentecostal elders. So she's coming in today to talk to us all about what it's like to grow up Pentecostal, grow up as a woman in Pentecostalism. So g'day Brie, how are you? Hello. I should just say right off the bat that my parents are no longer Pentecostal elders or in the Pentecostal church. So they're not saved is what you're saying? Go straight to hell. Mm, in a handcuff. They're not even married anymore. What? Oh, well, Crazy. as Troy and I have, have spoken about, you know, we're, we're both divorced as well. So God, it's we've just got a, a full package of hellboundness. Sounds fun. I'm actually now in continued sin because I've remarried. Oof. Yeah, without the blessing of the church, et cetera, et cetera. I, I covered bases and I'm living de facto. So, you know, it's you know, it's it's how life works. Anyway, we we're taking away from the fact that we've got we've got our guest Bree here. So Bree, welcome. It's Thank it you. is it is great to have you here. And and look, for some people in our Facebook group may know Bree because Bree is one of our admin. We have some wonderful admin in the group. Bree, we're gonna chuck it over to you. Tell us a little about a little bit about you. Where'd you come from? Who are you? Who are you, Brie? Yeah, who who is Brie besides a cheese? <laughs> well, for starters, it's B R E E, -E, so it's not like the cheese. And I think for anybody who grew up in the church reading uh, C S Lewis, you could say it's Brie like the horse. That might not be uh, a reference that all of our listeners will get, but there is a horse in uh, The Horse and His Boy, and that horse's name is Brie. But that's not who I was named after. <laughs> oh, I thought that's where you were going. And, you know, I mean, no, apparently. Or for Lord of the Rings fans, Brie like the village. Uh, okay, so we've established you are not like cheese. That is, that is good. It's good not to be like I cheese. I mean, people love me. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love I love Brie. I love I love you, Brie, and I, I love Brie cheese. Double Brie it has to be double or triple yep. Brie. But yep. but where did where did you grow up? What sort of environment did you grow up in? So I was I was born into the church. I was born a Christian. I like to say. Well, I don't like to say that because that sounds weird. Um, but my parents were in a CRC church before I was born. What's the CRC for those listeners who don't know? I believe it stands for Christian Revival Crusade. Um, I know back in season one, in one of the earlier episodes, Troy did a real deep dive into the CRC and the uh, revival centres. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. They were they were originally the National Revival Crusade, then they became the Commonwealth Revival Crusade, then they became the Christian Revival Crusade, and now they're just known as CRC Church. There you go. So that's the environment I was born into. It was a small family church. I don't really remember my time there because we we had moved from that church when I was a toddler. Some of our family still went there and we had friends that we still saw that went there. And in fact, one of my friends in particular, she's actually in our Facebook group, 
she was at that same church that I was born into. We are still good friends. She's actually she's actually my god sister, if that's a thing. The 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 daughter of my godparents. I've always found that the godparent thing like slightly confusing. Like, what is it? Is is, is your if your parents die, these are the people. <laughs> that's that... what I always thought when I was growing up. Is that oh, if my parents die, these this funny couple over here that are really um, lovely but loud. Let's harken back because let's give people a little bit of a, a lesson. So let's harken back to the early days of, you know, Anglicanism and Catholicism and all that kind yep. of shit. So a godparent wasn't just about someone that would take care of you. At your baptism, they would stand there and be nominated as someone that would continue to raise you in the faith if something happened to your parents as well. It wasn't just material. Um, you know, material welfare, they would actually raise you in the faith. So a, a God, and that's why they were God parents, right? Because they were yeah. raising you in the Christian faith. And I think it's sort of spilled over into sort of mainstream society. The most of us sort of had God parents, but really it was more, it was more sort of a welfare thing. So you didn't end up in this, in the system. It's it's interesting because the, the Pentecostal scene sort of took this on as a broad, from memory and from my experience, more of a broader concept. So when people would go up, remember people who do run them baptisms for a baby, they do dedications. So people would go up the front. Yeah, dedicate. love songs and dedications. That's right. <laughs> and love songs and dedications. You've um, got the voice for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's a shout out to you, bro. We've got this system within Pentecostal churches where someone goes up they or a couple go up, they dedicate their child to Christ, and then the congregation who is there that day is often asked, do you agree to, you know, be there, to be by the side of these parents, to help them, help the child walk in the way of Christ and all that? That's been my experience of it. So I, I do think that there there has been evolution of that to Pentecostalism. Yeah, because they moved away from infant baptism. You can't be baptised as an infant. So, but they like they like that whole baby dedication. That's exactly my experience, and that was my experience growing up in the church. I must have been to hundreds of baby dedications over the years, and we actually, after our first child was born, twelve and a half years ago, we actually did participate in a baby dedication at the larger sort of mega church Pentecostal church we were attending at the time. But instead of just doing one baby dedication, because it was a large church, it would be like conveyor belt baby dedication. <laughs> you would have half a dozen or more couples up there with their baby all doing their dedication at once. Like a like a Mooney's mass wedding, except it's a Pentecostal mass baby yeah, dedication. Yep, yep. Brilliant. Yep. But we didn't nominate, or I don't remember, I don't think we nominated any godparents for our son. If we did, I've forgotten who they are. So if you're listening. <laughs> if you're listening, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so is he. And the, our two girls never participated in a dedication. So, Yeah, I, I don't think from it because I was still involved in the church. And even I, when I was in Churches of Christ, that's where I was when my daughters were born. And people did do dedications but i'm just i'm just looking back we never de dedicated our children so maybe that was a sign of of things to come one of the things i like to say is that i have ticked pretty much every experience on your christian bingo card everything i did up until about the age of 19 20 was like heavily in the pentecostal microcosm or at least you know the broader evangelical microcosm the only part of my life that wasn't explicitly Pentecostal in my childhood years was my government primary school that I attended. But even then, the great part about that was that I got to spend six days at school because apart from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, on a Sunday morning, our church actually ran out of my primary school hall. That's very Pentecostal. It's a very, 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 very Pentecostal. I can still hear the sound of those plastic chairs on the wooden floor at uh, 8.30 in the morning when we had to get there. As children of, of elders and parents who played guitar and sang in the church band, we had to be there nice and early to, uh, to get setting up, cleaning the chairs, dusting, setting up the tea and coffee, all that fun stuff. So were you in the sort of scripture in song style 
time there or was it more sort of the hill songy? Oh, we had everything. Yeah, like the scripture and song and we had stuff from Phil Pringle in the when Hillsong started churning out their three chords in different variations, uh, we had all of that. I was an expert on the old overhead projector. And we had a roster amongst the youth kids or the sort of the tween ages. And I reckon I was on that roster more than anybody else because I was just so fucking good at it. It's one of my proudest achievements and one of the weirdest skills that I learnt uh, in the Pentecostal church. In all honesty, I do think it's a skill because I remember when people that weren't quite skilled in the overhead projector would then put the the wrong film on and people would lose their place if people didn't yep. know the song. And then, the, as we know, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come properly. Or when they when they couldn't work out that it was it was a mirror image, they had to move it left if you wanted to go right. Up if you wanted to go down. Yeah, or, or they or they wouldn't get the words up in time. Yes. You know what I mean? And you'd all be, be going, prepared. you know, blessed be the uh, <laughs> uh, almighty. Yeah. And anyway. I was one of those, like, I was one of those pedantic overhead projector operators that would move, I would move the film up, like, line by line. So it was like, it was like yeah, a you screen. Were good. The technology in the 90s, man. <laughs> This is unbelievable. And, and you know, being a millennial, I mean, you would have, surely that wouldn't have lasted too long. There would have been computers with screens and, and a, a projector come on Not in the soon. school hall. By the time we left that particular church, and that's that's the church that was really like a borderline cult, by the time we left that church, they were still using the overhead projector. And that was in, I want to say that was in 2000. Wow, they were really behind the times. Or well, they were still in the school hall. Yeah, slightly popo, obviously, yeah. and things were still expensive. The uh, the best thing about meeting in the school hall was that once a term, when the school held a working bee on a Sunday morning, I got to uh, cower in shame as all my schoolmates would look through the window at these weird people singing to Jesus on a Sunday morning instead of running around planting saplings and shoveling mulch in the schoolyard. That was great. Loved that. I would have cowered in shame. As, as we know, <laughs> I've, I've, I've carried a lot of shame around this belief system. Were you then, I assume it was the same school hall that you then met for assembly on a Monday morning. So were you yeah. tempted to then belt out a few choruses <laughs> Monday at assembly? No, but I did in my, in my later primary school years, I did play the recorder for our school song and the national anthem. So I was I was just up the front of that school hall all the time. I'd worn a little worn a little divot at the at the front of the hall. Dedication. Dedication. <laughs> so what was it like? Like you were saying it was borderline cultish. Like what was it about it that made it borderline cultish? What were some of those experiences? Mm. Some of what went on in that church is not my story to tell. So I've got to be careful. But suffice to say, there was a real culture which came from the leadership of nobody could or should do anything that wasn't expressly permitted by the leadership or by by the pastor, really. There was a lot of personal control and manipulation and spiritual abuse and and physical abuse. Um, and that, you know, that's, again, that's not my story to tell, but but people very close to me were severely harmed criminally. And so when all that came to light in 2000, we we left pretty quickly and we ended up at a, a large church, a large Pentecostal church, which at the time, when we, when we left the tiny culty church and went to the big, bright, shiny Pentecostal church, it was actually really lovely at first. I don't know if anyone else can relate to that, but it felt like like going from a, a dodgy little cafe into like a big chain store where they know what they're doing. I don't know if that makes sense. I, to I you. think that makes total sense. I mean, that's my story as well, Brie, of going mm. from the Revival Centre to Great Big AOG. And Great Big AOG was just, it was just so well lit and there was, you know, pink pink carpet and light walls and it just and and there was just this sense of it just being so much lighter and so much better 
you know, obviously as I got deeper and deeper, I started to see the cracks, but nevertheless, that initial step is, was, was really wonderful. But before we go too much into this, to your second church, coming back to the first church, what did you see and what can you remember from your own experience that make, made you think, yeah, actually I can resonate that this was a bit culty? It pro- probably doesn't speak to the cultiness so much as it does just to maybe the experience of girls and women growing up in the Pentecostal church. I know that I was, for me, I was, and and the other girls around me too, but I think maybe more so because of my personality and my people-pleasing nature is that I was groomed, I guess, from a young age into a life of service, right? You know, speaking about my, my first, one of my first jobs being doing the overhead projector, but I was also roped in to help with the creche, um, to be a children's church leader, um, a youth leader. What else have I done? Helped lead worship, taken communion, tithes messages, all of that sort of stuff. From from quite a young age, you are expected to serve and help. And I think particularly for women, that is more much more pronounced. Do you think that's an attitude, it's a gendered attitude towards women supporting men? Because we've certainly spoken about our experience as a male in that space. There was a lot of entitlement. From a female's perspective, what was it about it? I think in the church, there are many, many more unpaid roles for women than there are for men. Some of the things that I have been expected to do and yes I did them voluntarily but these are the things that the boys were never asked to do be an admin assistant I was an admin assistant for years years and years and years in the in the in the great big CCC which was the big church we started going to I was asked to cook for youth camps not having had any experience at cooking for large groups of people but simply because I was a woman and I was someone who was just always there because that's what you do. You put your hand up for things. Um, but none of the boys would have ever ever have been asked to cook. This was before I was an adult, really. Just because I happened to be female, ah, obviously she can cook for sixty kids for a week in another state. (laughs) Do you do you think that that gendered responsibility or that line is something that's mirrored from generally from society? I mean we see a lot of that in more general society, or do you think it's magnified within certainly your experience? You can only speak to your experience, but do you think there was a magnification of that? One hundred percent. Yeah, I think I think you're right. In society, there is, you know, there's been a lot of conversations recently about the mental and emotional load that women carry. But I think, as a Christian or as a Pentecostal, someone in the church, yes, it is absolutely magnified because. You've got, generally, in power, you've got men who are calling the shots and they're using their interpretation of scripture to to control the people around them. I know some people will probably, well, maybe not our listeners. (laughs) Our listeners probably won't have a problem with me saying that. I was thinking about my daughter's netball, for example, and... When I, when I go to my daughter's netball games, you know, they've got a little tuck shop canteeny thing and then they've also got a sausage sizzle as well. And mostly the women are in the canteen sort of selling the drinks and the snot blocks and all that kind of stuff. That's what the women are doing. And then you might get a man out there on the barbie, right? And you might even get a few men out there on the barbie because for some reason men are allowed to do that. I, I guess what I'm sort of saying there is, yes, it's extremely gendered in that context as well. But I just want to, for the sake of our listeners who've never been in the Pentecostal church, let's, let's dig into that. How is it more magnified than that? I know it is because I felt it and I lived it, but it's really hard. And maybe this is part of the, the gaslighting nature of having grown up in the church is that you start like even, even now, even, you know, a decade out, I still question myself and my own experience. What about then in terms of the hierarchy and leadership? That's probably a really easy way to see it magnified. You know, who who held the ultimate power and who could never hold the ultimate power? Unlike my daughter's netball, 
where there could be people of various genders holding leadership roles. Yeah, I think it's more magnified because at the end of the day, even though in the Pentecostal church and in particular the great big CCC church was all about, you know, oh, well, women can preach and women can be leaders and women can do anything that a man can do. But at the end of the day, it's still a man that has the top job, right? It's still a man who's the senior pastor and his wife, or you might have the man and his wife are the senior ministers. It's very rare, and I know there are churches that that exist, but we're talking about my experience is that I know the church that I was in, it wouldn't have even been a question of, of oh, maybe we could have a female senior minister. That would never happen, not, not with the leadership the way that it was when I was there. Roles for women were very much... Well, they tended to be support roles, didn't they? I mean, even the, you know, the woman pastor that's there, she's there because of the man. I mean, let's look at Hillsong, right? You know, Bobby was there because of Brian. Bobby wasn't there because of Bobby. And even when Brian was stood down, well, all of a sudden Bobby was done. It wasn't like, you know, Bobby's standing on her own two feet. Yeah. So the roles for women in the church are, are quite traditional still, I think. So you might have a, a woman who's the worship pastor because singing is a feminine experience, right? And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying I believe that, but I think in the church singing these lovey-dovey worship songs to Jesus is my boyfriend, like that's, that's a job for the women. And women can be the women's pastor. Women can be the children's pastor. It's it's very compartmentalised, I think, whereas a man can just be the pastor or the connections pastor or the associate pastor, executive pastor. But it's very, in my experience, rare to have women in those more general roles. Women have the more specific, caring, nurturing, taking care of details roles. And I think something that's subtle is that women can have only certain roles, but ultimately men can have every one of them. You know, like you can have a man being the children's pastor. You can have a man leading the songs, etc. Now you can't have a woman in every role in the church. It just doesn't exist. It's not possible. If I think about my experience, if I think about being groomed to be a pastor, you know, I've told this in my story earlier that it was like, you're going to be a pastor, you've got the right attributes, you should train up. So I went to Bible college, did all that. During that time, I met my ex-wife who at that time you know, was very much her own person, very creative, you know, had studied in the arts and all that sort of stuff. However, the response was, we'll get married, I'll be a senior pastor, and she will live a life of support. And I absolutely bought into that. And I absolutely transferred that into my marriage, which is probably in in the end, this sort of contribute, not sort of, but contributed to a breaking down, because that's the model that you bring in um, is that your wife or she will support you and she will make sure that your ministry can run well by doing everything else incredibly patriarchal but it's subtle it's accepted and it then perpetuates that happening over and over and over and it's still happening now as much as they say that they might be looking at ways to adapt that within the church it still happens absolutely this is my experience again. It wasn't so much that women couldn't lead or couldn't have um, influence over the congregation. It was more that there still needs to be a man above that as a covering, right? Because women women are dangerous. Women have feelings that can't be trusted. And that is certainly um, my experience as a woman in the church is that you can't trust your feelings you have to trust God and often trusting a a man's interpretation of what God is saying right this is why Whitney Houston was evil because she was saying how will I know trust your feelings (laughs) and and that's how you really know he loves you but I I think the flip side of that is as a woman in the Pentecostal in the Pentecostal church firstly number one we're socialized to believe that we have so many 
more feelings than men you know we're emotional beings we're you know we're soft and caring and we're more affected by the things around us so we need we need a man to 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 help support us and be strong for us and i don't necessarily think that that is unique to pentecostalism or even christianity though it certainly takes on a different flavor in the church i think just because of the way that we use scripture to or twist scripture to support anything that we want to say or believe the second part of that is that yes number one women have so many more feelings than men but number two we can't trust those feelings those feelings are of the flesh and the mind and not the spirit so as a woman in the pentecostal church you're you're already playing with a handful of shitty cards right because there are more hurdles for god to jump to get to you because god's got to you know swim his way through all those horrible feelings to get to your to get to your spirit um and there's the idea that women are more easily deceived by those feelings because those feelings come from somewhere else and that we need special guidance i guess well you ate the fruit didn't you that's that's what happened you know <laughs> let us all into sin but you, you, I mean, this is the power of gender though because as as a male like i just one thing I really struggle with is is I'm I'm an empath. So I really take on people's hurt, people, which which doesn't make a great combination for a social worker sometimes, which are you know, a social worker, because you've got to you've got to find tools then to be able to make sure that you don't take that on. That stuff was really obvious though, that it, and that's what ultimately led me into my profession now. But I think it also led me in to wanting to be a pastor, wanting to help, wanting to stand by people. But as a guy, because I have a dick, I I could I could embody those what are seen as um, traditional female attributes, and that was fine. But you're right; those attributes, when they're seen in a female, um, are seen as negative. So it's it's a really interesting take on things. That's probably one of the reasons why it's really easy if you're a, a Pentecostal minister and maybe we just need to do a crash course for Pentecostal ministers right now in how to gaslight women into <laughs> into staying subservient and staying in the church and doing what they're told is that all you have to do is tell them that their feelings aren't of the spirit and that whatever they're feeling is wrong and that they just need to trust God, which, aka, trust the minister. I think that particular phenomenon is is something that keeps a lot of women easily controlled because it's preached from the pulpit. It's is everywhere. I remember going to women's meetings where where that was preached. Don't get me started on women's meetings, but <laughs> it's the use of authority. No, I, I think let's talk about women's meetings. It's it's that use of authority to to keep. Not just women, but everybody's subservient. But mm. in in your instance, coming from a, a woman's perspective, I think absolutely it's it's really important to hear about women's meetings. Oh, women's meetings! I hated going to women's meetings. They were always, and probably just because I wasn't the right type of woman. Like I was never, I was never the real girly type. Or the real womanly type, right? I didn't like doing the flower arranging and the baking. And I still did those things. Or not the flower arranging, but I still, I remember baking like half a dozen cakes at a time for women's meetings. One thing that, (laughs) this is nothing to do necessarily with anything spiritual or biblical, but one thing I hated about women's meetings was hearing a room full of women just shrieking with laughter at something that wasn't funny just pissed me off so much (laughs) but no one particular thing I remember from a women's meeting is um it might have been a it might have even been a women's conference but we broke off into smaller groups like like sort of breakout rooms and you could choose where you wanted to go and I was a newlywed at this stage so I decided to go into the sex talk because I thought oh you know maybe I need to I need to get some get some tips some hot tips from the from the pastor's wife i i just think it's funny cuz brian and i are always going into the sex talk <laughs> in the women's meetings <laughs> they wouldn't let us in no but the only thing i remember from this particular breakout group was there was probably 25 30 women and we were sitting in a big circle it was essentially 
a rundown of these are the things you can and can't do when you have sex with your husband. Things <laughs> like doggy style. You couldn't do anything that was seen as demeaning or degrading, which like kudos to the church, I guess, for saying that you shouldn't do anything like doggy style because that's like that's like bestiality then. Or um <laughs> you couldn't do anal sex because that that was just that was just bad. And I I distinctly remember the look on the pastor's wife's face because she was tasked with taking this group. And I think she really didn't want to take it or be there. But I remember when she started talking about anal sex and her face was just like, I do not want to be talking about this, but no, you should not be having anal sex because it's dirty and wrong. <laughs> but I just, I sat in that meeting very, very quiet and just listened to all these paranoid women around me talking about what kind of sex constituted okay sex when you're married. The I don't feel like the intent there was to control the women in the room. I think it I think it really was just about geez, I don't even know. It was such a weird meeting. <laughs> this was great big CCC in the in the sort of mid two thousands, right? So yes, fairly liberal. I remember around town and around the other sort of mega churches that we were allowed to associate with because they had to be of the same caliber, right? You couldn't you couldn't partner with a, a smaller church down the road. You had to partner with, you know, the crossways and the the care forces, the other big churches that were doing great things to take the city for Jesus, right? Our great big CCC was known as the drinking church because we were allowed to drink. And the pastor would often talk about having a glass of wine from the pulpit, which coming from the cultish church that we had come from into this great big church, having a pastor who talked about drinking wine and watching Gladiator at the movies and occasionally swearing from the pulpit was like, oh my goodness, it was like this a revelation of grace, right? But I think similarly to you, Troy, once you have been steeped in that environment, for some time and you start to see behind the curtain and you start to see the emperor without clothes <laughs> and see the cracks, the cracks that start to form, then you do realise that a lot of it is about control. Yeah, look, I think a lot of it is. I mean, it, they might have been trying to come from a caring place telling you about what positions you can perform during sex, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it has to do with anything within somebody's marriage like it, it's it's weird I mean I can understand them saying hey you probably shouldn't be part of swingers groups you, you probably should stay faithful to your partner that these are you know but telling you what position you can have and perform during sex I mean that, that's I don't know for me it's complete and under control it's a bit of an overreach isn't it like as if as as if as a woman you're going to go you're going to go to your to your female pastor. Oh, look, me and my husband had anal sex last night. What do I need to do to get forgiveness? <laughs> well, I guess that's better than going to your pastor and saying me and your husband had anal sex last night. <laughs> hey, I, I just want to um, stop us here and, and come back to talking about this this role of women focus that we had a moment ago because I wanted to sort of point out that you have this authoritative text that is supposedly governing everything that we do. And let's face it, inside this authoritative text, which is thousands of years old, there's some pretty full-on verses, even paragraphs, about the role of women. And I'm just sort of thinking, is that one of the things that, that you think influenced the way the Pentecostals and, and other Christians are slower to move out of that the, the the culture is moving on, but they're sort of stuck. Do you think it's because of the text? Do you think it's this is what the Bible says? I'm not sure on that one, actually. Because they'll certainly use it. If you go and say, hey, I want to, you know, it depends on the church you're in, but I want to preach. I'm sorry, the Bible says women keep silent. Women should not have authority over a man. Women should not teach. I think in the church that I was in, there was a veneer, at least, of egalitarianism. It wasn't it wasn't ever suggested to me or as far as I know to the people around me that oh you know you can't preach or teach because you're a woman. And those those verses were exegeted and explained away, basically, to say, well, 
that that doesn't apply basically i think in the pentecostal church it was in the liberal pentecostal church it was less about what the bible said because honestly there were sometimes there were sermons where the bible really wasn't used that much it was basically a monologue for the minister to talk about whatever vision or whatever thing he had going on at that time <laughs> So it was less about a focus on scripture, I think, and more just about the general culture. Like like take modesty culture, for example. I think in the liberal Pentecostal church, modesty and appearance, it it's, can often be an unspoken thing, but there's this undercurrent of there's a very, very, very fine line, I think, between you've got to be fashionable and you've got to look good, but you can't look too good, right? And you can't be on stage if you're not, fashionable and you notice that when you when you see planet shakers or or hillsong or or other places like that that have a big online presence you notice everybody on stage and particularly the women are very well groomed and very um and very up with the latest fashions right but you can't have a have a top that's too low cut or jeans that are too tight and that's what Jeff Bullock said about Brian Houston saying, put the pretty girls at the front. It's interesting. It wasn't put the pretty boys at the front. It was put the pretty girls at the front. So it is even that. There's there's a gender bias, a gender push, whatever you want to call it, that the women are still expected to be more beautiful. It's not mm-hmm. such a thing for the men. Mm-hmm. The men can be powerful and the women can be beautiful. Yeah. And I think it's funny, like, the women in Pentecostal churches have a very distinct look and sometimes like you're walking down the street or at a shopping centre and sometimes I feel like you can pick the people out of a crowd who are modern Pentecostal women just by the way that they dress. It's really bizarre. Um, I remember, I can't remember where I was, but there was we were somewhere on holidays and there was a couple nearby us and they were looking around this area where we happened to be having a like a picnic lunch and just from a distance, I could tell, I, I, I picked him up, like, that, that couple over there, they're, they're like a pastor and his wife or something. They were a young couple. And eventually they came over to us and handed me a, like a tract from their church. And I was like, oh, pick him from a mile away, just, just purely by the way that the woman was dressed. It was really bizarre. For me, though, I felt like I could never toe that line of, of having the right look because I didn't understand it. And I don't know if that was just a little bit of, I don't know, neurodivergence on my part. Um, I didn't understand why you would want to look the same as everyone else. And I still don't get it. I mean, there's nothing to me that's more embarrassing than wearing something that's super on trend, right? But in the Pentecostal church, you're expected to be on trend as a woman. I think it's a spirit of rebellion, Brie. I'm, <laughs> I'm picking up. I think in mega church culture, particularly, like you have to dress the part, part of the acceptance code. <laughs> that was something I struggled with, to to dress the part because I was I was always that kid that liked to shop in op shops and be different from everyone else, I guess. Um, so that was something that was a struggle for me to be accepted because um, I just I didn't have as much of a drive, I guess, to be like everybody else. What was the impact of that? Like, what was the impact of you not wanting to toe the line with this stuff? And not that you were doing it, you know, presumably um, because you were rebellious, because it just wasn't you. What was what was the impact of that? Yeah, what was the cost? What did it cost you to stand up and say, I, I don't want to do this? Or even if you didn't say it, you just started to not do this. Oh, yeah, I definitely didn't stand up and say, I don't want to do this. I think I was, I always was and I always felt like I never really fit in. And I don't think that was just a fashion thing. I think that was probably also a brain thing, but also from a very young age, I, I always found myself probably in my thinking, and I wouldn't have thought it at the time, was quite rebellious, not in a wanting to misbehave sense, but in a sense of inside my own head, I would often find myself questioning things that were taught from the pulpit. Just in my own time, I, I rarely, rarely, rarely ever voiced these concerns or doubts. I would just, because I'm quite an introverted person, I would just go away and sort of just mull things over in my head and just come to my own conclusions about what I believed and, you know, 
hell to everyone else. I didn't care. <laughs> but but that didn't really have any real world real world implications on me until I did start voicing some of some of my different ways of thinking, I guess. And that wasn't until until after I'd had kids and and started coming out of the church, I guess. Um, one of the big catalysts for me in in coming out of the church, well, there are a few things. The first thing was actually when I married my husband. Um, now he's actually the son of a Pentecostal minister, so <laughs> that was that's another tick in the bingo card for me. But he was he had already decided that church wasn't for him by the time we got married. So that was one catalyzing factor for me leaving the church, and I probably played right into their hands there by um, by being unequally yoked. Um, and another catalyzing factor for me leaving the church was was when I had children and I realized, hang on a minute, all these things they say about God being a loving parent, now having children of my own and like loving these children to death, I, I just couldn't square what, what people said about God being a loving parent and the way that they said that God behaves. I just didn't understand it. And the, probably the third thing for me was... Um, a friend of mine came out as gay and and was shock horror was still a christian um so that was another another path of doubt and wonder that i went down um and so i started voicing these questions um i started writing a blog i had i had people i had people chastising me privately like sending private messages oh you know you shouldn't be writing about this sort of stuff fortunately i had many more people sending me messages saying ah oh, it's not just it's not just me. I thought I was the only one. You know, thank you for for talking about this. So, for me as a woman in the church, someone who didn't at that time I didn't have a leadership role that had any any teeth. You know, I was a I was a youth leader, um, not the youth leader, just you know one of the youth leader underlings. For me, I think the technology that we have these days, where everybody can have their thoughts and put them out there that was a real a real strength because I couldn't get up in in the pulpit and tell people what I thought but I could write a blog and I could say this is what I think um I think people didn't like that people with power people with power and control have really struggled with um things like social media and um the blogging and and podcast platforms because anybody can now have a platform and anybody can now have an audience um, you don't need a special dispensation from from your denomination to be able to influence and teach people. I don't know if you remember I told the story of getting up to speak before I sang, before I did an item in church, and I got up and had a bit of a spiel about some things that were on my mind, and afterwards I was called into the pastor's office and told that I had to earn the right to speak, and I hadn't earned the right to speak, and and it was, and, and I reflected at the time saying, well, he happened to be the son of the senior pastor. And so obviously he didn't earn anything. It was all just given to him because of his surname. But that's exactly what you're talking about, that they controlled the voice. They controlled the, the channels of communication and they've lost that in a lot of ways. And some of our more extreme churches like the hardcore culty style Pentecostal churches or even, you know, your, your Jehovah's Witnesses, et cetera, they will actually make blanket statements. You're not allowed to go on the internet or you're not allowed to go on social media. And that's what they do to keep people people off that. But our more smaller liberal Pentecostal churches, uh, no, no, we're not going to use social media for Jesus. And so they, they lo they've lost that control, haven't they? Oh, absolutely. I don't really write on my blog anymore, but for a good three or four years like that was that was my outlet and that was the way that I could have a voice and particularly as a woman as I saw like my contemporaries and my peers who were male getting up to preach and teach and you know go international and have huge audiences and that was not something that I ever aspired to do but they were way more way more men doing that than women but for me writing and and being able to have a voice at least on the internet was a huge thing and I think it 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 was a huge thing for a lot of women around the same time um not that I would ever compare myself to someone like Rachel Held Evans or or Sarah Bessie but these were some of the women that that I was 
reading at the time and going, oh, hang on a minute, like I can do that. Like I can, that's how I can have a voice and that's how I can, um, I guess, connect with other people who are having similar experiences without having to get up or without having to, without having to have permission or without having to have someone to look over my notes and say, oh, yes, this is rubber stamp, approve, you can talk about this stuff. Were you still in Great Big CCC when you were blogging or had you already stopped attending church? I was on a very slow and gentle ramp down, (laughs) put it that way. I was still a member of the church. I was still very involved socially with various groups. All, all my, all the births of my children are sort of blurring into one, but I believe after my first child was born, I did go back into youth leadership for a while. Um, but once the second and third came along, it was just too, it was too difficult. But yes, I was still involved. I was still a member. I was still attending on Sundays, not every week, but as often as I could. So what did that cost you, Brie, if you were blogging like that? Yes, you were getting sort of chastising emails, but, you know, do you remember Josie McSkimming talked about sometimes it's not a, it's not a revival center, you're out, goodbye, push, but sometimes it can just be this sort of freezing over where it just, you just start to get frozen out very slowly and you wake up one day and realize I don't belong here anymore. Yep. That was, you've described it perfectly, that slow freezing over or the slow squeezing out and I I want to be as kind as possible to the people who were in my friendship group at the time I I am still still friends with a couple of them but I don't think it was an intentional oh we need to push Brie out because she doesn't believe the right things I think it's when you stop driving with the particular culture and you can't get on board with with the group think some of it is that people stop being able to relate to you and then the other side of that coin is, well, you stop being able to relate to them. And so what's the point in hanging out? Because they're talking about the favour of the Lord and diamonds appearing miraculously and you're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, no, I, I, I don't know how to be in that environment because I don't agree that the favour of the Lord is a thing that means you will get a really nice car or that you'll randomly find a wad of money in your letterbox. I think... You know, you're right, be kind to them because I think you would have presented a danger. So if they saw you as on your way out, you were someone who perhaps, you know, you don't want to be aligned with, you want to make sure that you stay within the safety and under the covering of the Lord, all of that sort of shit which is drummed into people, I think that's where they have a genuine fear to engage with people that they see who are backsliding would be the the word. And you would have presented the danger. But that, again, and I know I keep harping back to it, shows the level of control yep. that these congregations are under. I mean, that that is even a fear because it should be a completely opposite to that if if they were true to what their biblical beliefs were about uh, biblical, sorry, um, scripture says about, you know, standing by people, being there for for others, bring them to the Lord and all that sort of stuff. Mm. It's just, yeah, it's a crock. Yeah, but Brian, can I throw something in that at the same time, and this is the thing about the Bible, right, we cherry pick because the Revival Centre, for example, and not just the Revival Centre, but the Jehovah's Witnesses will take those verses that say, you know, if your brother is is off, treat him as an unbeliever. Don't Don't even eat with him. You know, don't even eat with such a one. And so there are verses to justify the shunning. On the one hand, you've got the the lovely Jesus verses that are saying, you know, be kind to love everyone. But at the same time, there are scriptural justifications for a lot of this stuff that happens. And I think that sort of speaks to what I call, you know, when I, I said once before that we were dickheads even back in the second century you know, the first century. I mean, there was this stuff was definitely going on and we take those verses and we cherry pick them. So I, I, and and that's what I was sort of making the point to Brie earlier about the role of women. There is scriptural justification for this kind of subjugation of females. It exists. I think you're right. And, you know, you can use anything in scripture to justify your your position we we see that and we see it all the time but you know coming back to you brewing your experience 
as a woman. I mean, you ha- have definitely spoken to us about lots of the stuff that that has happened and sort of your journey out, some of it by being frozen out. Where are you at now? This is the question that's probably hardest to answer out of all of them because I have settled in this place of really, really, really comfortable uncertainty. And for a long time, I was uncomfortable with that uncertainty. And I, and I really wanted to get to a place where I had, where I had reconstructed. But right now I'm sort of in this place of going, well, I don't, I don't know if I care enough anymore. I still feel like I have this very enduring connection to, to what I used to call God. I don't really call that God anymore other than just as a way of having a common language with other people but I don't relate to somebody called God and you know maybe it's just maybe it's just my inner voice maybe it's just my conscience maybe it's just me getting to know my authentic self but I do feel whoever that person was that I have known from a very young age I feel like I still like that that person that god person is still the same and has remained the same from the time i was a child until now despite all the other shit that's gone on through the through the various churches that i've gone through and the various iterations of of who who god has been sold to me as for me that inner knowing of of the pulse that exists underneath life and the universe i still feel like i have a lovely connection with it. I don't know if that makes sense. It's very sort of like you couldn't talk about that in church, could you? <laughs> oh, no, you, you couldn't. And look, I think it's something that you share with Troy and I. Like I think that's a place of a comfortable not knowing, but also not caring because it's it's not it's not important to you anymore that you have to define that. Like who tells you you have to define that? But also it, it's it's something like I, I think I, I have retained that spirituality, which I had before I came mm. back with the church, it, and I still have it now. And I don't really know what it is. You know, some of it is humanistic, some of it is just um, feeling a connection to place, to earth, to the planet we're on, and doing the best that we can for our fellow humans. Um, and, and I think there's something deeply and importantly spiritual about that as a descriptor i mean what would you say troy well i was just thinking about what clint haycock said last week about he's a practical atheist in the sense that he doesn't pray and read his bible if he's got a big decision to make right and i was thinking i still still myself you know when i've got a uh, a conundrum in front of me, I will still still myself and not quite listen to this still small voice, but you know what I'm saying? I sort of stop and go, what, what's the sense? And maybe that's just me. Like Bree just said a moment ago, maybe that's just my inner voice and probably, right? This is where I sort of lean towards this sort of agnosticism or whatever, but okay, this is how I've been raised. You know, I have spent so many years of my life, the majority of years of my life, dealing with this whole God thing. And look, if it works and it's going to get me through and, you know, I die, does it really matter? Does it really matter if, you know, I have this slight delusion that helps me get through my week or my day or a tough decision or whatever? No. And so I'm not dissing either of you saying that you have this sense of the numinous and this sense of God for a second, but I'm going to throw out there and say, even if it's not true, who cares? It works for you. And, and you get by. And I think deconstructing and throwing out the bullshit of like, you know, we've been talking about today of, you know, subjugating and disparaging of women, whether you are a man or you are a woman, is a great thing to get rid of. If, if that makes you have a cleaner version of your godly delusion or a cleaner version of a, a legitimate relationship with God, so be it. And I think that's the joy of deconstruction, isn't it? That we become better people. Written and spoken by Troy on behalf of the <laughs> I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist Party. I think my my deconstructing journey, I actually found it, my deconstruction was quite 
enjoyable and lovely and um, such, for me, an enriching life experience. And so I really struggle to relate when when other people say, oh, de- you know, the, the grief of deconstructing, I never had that. I never experienced that grief. I was always sort of, I've always felt led by this wonder of exploration and and discovery. For me, it was like having grown up with a very narrow worldview, all of a sudden seeing these great big doors open and you're looking out into this incredible view and going, ah, oh, there's all this other stuff out here that I get to now explore. And it wasn't, for me, it wasn't scary. So, yeah, I was listening to your last week's episode and he was talking about reconstructing, like reconstructing your identity after fundamentalism and that the deconstructing process that I found so, like, to me, that was that was where my faith really took off, I guess. And I still do identify as a person of faith and I still do most days identify as Christian. And that's really weird to me because you could take any of the fundamental tenets of Christianity and I would probably probably cross them all off say no don't believe that don't believe that don't know if I believe in a virgin birth don't know if I believe in in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ like all of that stuff I'm like I don't know if I can sign on to any of that and yet I still find myself not being able to let go of that label I'm not entirely sure what what that's about other than sometimes it's fun to piss off the Christians who think that I should be subscribing to all of that. I like to stir the pot. I was I was thinking about when you were talking about being in those women's meetings and just thinking you, you didn't fit and what the hell's going on here. And I was thinking back to what Clint said about those objections that come up inside us. That's actually our authentic self saying, I, I don't agree with this. I don't, I don't believe in this. And I was thinking at that moment, that was your authentic self. And maybe that's why you hated those meetings, because it was a lack of authenticity, at least from your perspective. Oh, 100%. And I think I've always had this sort of rebellious bent, but it's not really rebellious. It's just self-knowing and self, self-remembering. self Clint would call that agency, a sense of agency. Yeah. Yep. And I've, I think I've always had that sort of inner sense of agency. And perhaps that's why my deconstruction journey was quite a gentle and and largely positive one because I guess I I am a bit of a loner and a bit of a a rebel at heart even you know a quiet a quiet rebel and I think I started doing a lot of my own inner work before everything went to shit I was already attuned I guess to my authentic self and to what I believed before I fully stepped out of the church if that makes sense when everything went to shit for the first time in the in the culty church that we were in, I remember, I remember doing the old, getting out my Bible, my children's Bible, I think it was at the time. I was like sixteen or seventeen, and doing the flip and point. Did you ever do the flip and point? This was the 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 first and last time I did the flip and point after my parents had explained to us kids that we were leaving the church and the reasons why, and it was it was awful. And I was incredibly grief stricken at the time. And I remember pulling out my Bible one day and I did the flip and point and my finger landed on this verse in Psalms. I can't remember. I can't remember the chapter and verse because I haven't opened a Bible in years because that's what the internet's for these days, right? Um, But the verse was something like, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And I was like, all right, that was enough. That was enough for me. Like nothing else mattered other than this presence that I felt as God I felt like was saying to me, you're really brokenhearted right now and cool, I'm here with you. And that that's probably something that I've carried with me. Not that I would call this presence the Lord anymore. And again, as you say, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm close to myself when I'm brokenhearted. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And the reality is you don't have to call it anything. Exactly. Like whoever God, whoever God was or whoever God is, now um and I still have no idea as I said but I felt that God close to me and I still do um it's just not in the Christian sense right I don't feel close to Jesus I don't talk to Jesus I I just I find that I find it really weird when people talk to Jesus or or talk about 
loving Jesus. I've never, ever felt love for Jesus. And that's a weird thing to say as someone who, who still subscribes to the label Christian, right? It's just, a, I just live in this strange bowl of jelly. I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> it it's interesting because when Tom Tilly said that he realized that he didn't have this love for Jesus, that's when he walked away. Mm. And yet you're saying you're still not walking away. I, and I'm not suggesting you need to. I'm just drawing a, a line there and saying two people can come to a similar point and go yeah. in different directions. Yep. I've definitely walked away from the institutional church, at least the institutional Pentecostal church. But, I, you know, having said that, I haven't gone to any other. There's a little Anglican church down the road from me, actually, which the building's really lovely. And I thought, oh, maybe I should pop my head in there one Sunday morning and see what it's like. But I haven't been able to bring myself to do that yet. Bree, would you be willing to share the link to your blog for people to go back and look at what you were saying and thinking yeah, back sure. at that time? I will do that. Uh, it's it's just breemorel.com, B-R-E-E-M-O-R-E-L.com. Okay. I'll pop that in the show notes yeah. as well. Put it in the show notes because that's what we say in the business. We'll put it in put the it show in notes. Put it in the show notes. So I haven't, I haven't written anything on there for a few years now, but it's still there and it's – it's a great little snapshot into my world at the time where I was really, I guess, actively deconstructing. My experience is different to a lot of others who have deconstructed, I guess, who have left the church due to a particular event or due to a trauma or due to being mistreated. I sort of felt like I was ahead of the game in that sense, in that I left before I could be harmed. So I didn't leave, I didn't actually leave the church angry. I sort of, I left the church hungry. My appetite, I guess, grew beyond what the church was offering. And there was no longer anything within the walls of the church that was satisfying to me. So when I started deconstructing, it was like, it was like a smorgasbord. It was like, oh, wow, there is actually stuff here that can fill, fill my appetite. And I think those things do make quite a difference because I, I was the same. I didn't walk away angry. I was just mm. done. Yeah. I was done. You know, some of my deconstruction certainly helped with that because it happened over a very, very long time. Some of it conscious, some of it unconscious. Mm. But, you know, just getting to the end and knowing it's done. And as I've shared before, you know, it, it was convenient. I, I, I divorced and it was just like easy way to just walk away. But I know, Troy, your experience was different and it probably did shape the, the latter years yeah, yeah, I was I was very angry. I, I think this sense of the authentic self was something that I really lacked. I felt that my revival center and then great big AOG experience had really diminished my sense of self and I just didn't feel like I had one. And so it was rediscovering who I was from, you know, before I joined church, which was 12, and coming back to that pre-cult personality was, you know, it, it was extremely taxing and extremely traumatic you know and that's what I said to Clint fortnight ago as well was that for me it wasn't just the trauma from church it was also the trauma of deconstructing and losing it all mm. so so you know people have very very different experiences there's no doubt there's no there's no one way to leave is there I wonder if if and I, d I don't want to put this experience on all women or or take it away from men who've experienced the same thing but I wonder if for women we are much more socialized to abandon our authentic selves coming back to to the idea that women's women have a lot of feelings and yet those feelings aren't to be trusted perhaps it's much much easier for women in the church to to not listen to themselves or not listen to that that inner voice because we're told that we can't trust it and we don't know or we're not taught how to discern our feelings from the voice of god and, and perhaps coming out of that for women and obviously for some men too, given your experience, Troy, can be incredibly damaging and incredibly hard to find a sense of identity when everything else is stripped away. I think there's a song about that. Brie, living, living in the last days and coming to the end of time, what do you feel you have brought from your church days that you can say it's not all bad? here's what I've got. That is a really interesting question. 10 years ago, I probably would have said, oh, well, I, you know, I had a, a great education in a lot of the 
biblical stories and I I have a solid faith. But now, I don't know what I'd say now. I think all of our experiences can teach us something. If anything, it would be, oh, Jesus Christ, I don't know. <laughs> you just you just said that you don't speak to Jesus, but you just spoke. <laughs> all right, well, here we are at the end of time. Thank you very much, Bree. This this has been a, a really wonderful episode, and I don't say that flippantly. It's been really cool. I love that you've been able to speak to us about the female perspective of being a Pentecostal, and I think there's so much more on this topic, obviously, that two white men would love to, to unpack further on your behalf yeah. on another episode. No, but we, we've really appreciated you being here. We've really appreciated the input that you've brought and your perspectives. It's been really wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having me. I want to say I don't think my experience is universal for all women who grew up in Pentecostalism. I think there are probably a number of women who would have much more intelligent and erudite things to say than I've said but nevertheless I appreciate the opportunity giving me a platform two men giving a woman a platform to speak holy cow you know it's it's what we do and I, I just want to thank you for your vulnerability you know it, it is difficult I mean I we reflect on this often that we record an episode you know we we scratch it out a little bit about what we're going to talk about but you often just start talking about stuff that you haven't even thought you're going to talk about and it does it does dig up and it does hit those scars that sometimes you don't even know are there so thank you you may not have hit any of those scars you may not have dragged stuff up but uh, you made yourself vulnerable and just want to thank you for that and can I also say that Bree is an admin of our Facebook group so if you want to come and connect with Bree in some way ask her some questions etc please connect with her via the Facebook group. And also we did say we we're going to put her blog, which will be a snapshot in time, as she said, uh, but we'll definitely put that into the show notes as well. Bree, thank you very much for being a part of this. We really appreciate you being here. Brian, I'll see you in a fortnight's time, which is 14 nights. It is 14 nights and, and that is drummed into me forever in a day now. Mm-hmm.